And I'll give the floor to Jennifer Donathan. Awesome. Hello, everybody. Uh, happy Tuesday, March 5th. It is 2 p.m. Eastern. Thank you for joining us on our technical assistance webinar, um, specifically focused on the ED Expansion Toolkit, where we'll be highlighting a guest presentation from the Michigan PMHCA team. So on the screen, you can see our, a number of presenters here. Um, I'll go one, well, one by one to introduce. Um, so I'll start with Ann Kramer. She's a senior research associate at the University of Michigan Department of Psychiatry and the program director for the MC3 program. Um, areas of ex expertise include the development and oversight of behavioral health services for youth and families with a particular focus on community and school-based programs and the Im implementation of protocol-based research interventions involving adolescents and young adults at risk for suicidal behavior and suicide. Um, along with Anne today, we have some EIIC staff um, who will be presenting on the ED Expansion Toolkit. This is a new toolkit that we have just recently launched. Um, a huge thank you to the PMHCA teams who participated with us last year and really helping us lay the, the foundation for this. Um, we're going to focus on this toolkit to really help PMHCA teams navigate the process of working with emergency care providers, um, even for those who are in the thick of it, or even just in the exploratory phases, this toolkit can help serve um, those purposes. Um, and it also provides guidance on how to apply quality improvement methods to identify areas of improvement, create implementation plans, and measure change efforts. So we have a pretty loaded agenda today. So without further ado, I will hand it off to Ann Kramer. Oh, sorry. And our objectives for today, participants will be able to identify one step to begin their ED expansion project. So that is today's objective. And now I'll hand it over to Ann. Thank you. So my uh, goal here is to share with you our experience in Michigan of uh, facilitating and learning from focus groups for um, to help us with our planning for expansion to the ED setting. For um, so our uh, expanding our PMHCA program. So at the end of the slides, I did include the questions we use for our focus groups, the questions that were used for polls during the focus groups, as well as uh, surveys we sent to providers. So you can go to the next slide. Um, so just to orient people to Michigan, um, I'm just highlighting that the mental health crisis certainly continues in our state as it continues nationwide. We have suicide as the second leading cause of death for youth 10 to 14. Uh, emergency departments continue to report limited access to behavioral health clinicians and even more limited access to psych child psychiatry resources. The most common reasons for mental health ED visits in our state are suicidal thoughts and behaviors, mood and anxiety disorders, and disruptive and aggressive disorders. So just orienting you to that. Next slide, please. This all led us in Michigan to develop our statewide PMHCA program, and so uh, which has expanded considerably. So we are a same-day psychiatry consultation program for pediatric and perinatal providers. We provide uh, education, as well as uh, having a team of behavioral health consultants who uh, help providers and families navigate resources and referrals. So that's who we are. Uh, next slide, please. I just wanted to give you a sense of our, of our timeline. So we uh, initially uh, had our, our journey begin in 2011 when we developed our model for primary care. So we launched in 2012, our Pediatric Mental Health Care Access Program Psychiatry Consultation. And from there, added perinatal consultation services, uh, expanded statewide, introduced integrated care in the primary care setting of our behavioral health consultants, partnered with community mental health centers for those services, and, um, and then added on perinatal patient care services and it wasn't until 2023 that we had the opportunity to consider expansion into the schools and emergency department settings. So with initial funding from HRSA to explore expansion, we last year were given the opportunity to uh, 
to run some focus groups. I just wanted to say that we had, by the time we got the funding, we had two months to develop the focus groups, uh, consider the recruitment, complete the focus groups, analyze the data, analyze our findings, and consider then how we would proceed with our uh, grant submission to HRSA in partnership with the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. So very little bit of time to for this process. Uh, next slide, please. So our aim for the uh, for the expansion we received last year was simply to identify the needs of emergency department personnel in preparation for this expansion that would inform our future work, which now, of course, is to develop the workflows and the processes that are feasible, that are sustainable, that we can integrate into the ED setting, um, considering current staffing and workflow models to supplement the consultation with education and training and resource dissemination to, and to especially create linkages between our current efforts, our connection with the schools and primary care and ED settings. So that's the work beyond the initial work last year wanted to just orient you to that. Next slide, please. Our partners, um, you know, we, we talk in the, in the PMHC world, we all talk about the importance of relationships and certainly uh, relationships was a key factor in the success of, um, of, of launching this and doing this work. So we work so closely with the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services not just as our funder, but as an entity connected with other networks and other behavioral health programs within the state. So they helped us to identify potential participants and engaged what we call our advisory committee to do the same. So knowledge of these other initiatives and networks was essential to connecting with people to learn what might be needed in the emergency department setting. One such initiative is a SAMHSA funded project or program called Transforming Youth Suicide. So this was a grant, uh, has been a, was a five-year grant in Michigan with a network of emergency departments who all consider suicide prevention a core priority and consequently focusing on implementing evidence-based assessment, intervention, and continuity of care and follow-up strategies for youth at risk for suicide. A um, major component of this effort was a community of practice, practice and technical assistance. So we were looped into this network, which was a, a beautiful partnership to invite those participating in the community of practice to share uh, their, their needs and participate in the focus groups. We had our advisory committee uh, also who linked us to uh, people who would be interested in providing information to help inform our work. We had our own psychiatry faculty and clinicians leading the consult liaison services. So in our health system and many health systems, those running the consult liaison services are providing consultation already to the ED setting. So have quite a um, firsthand information about what might be helpful. The Michigan Public Health Institute was identified to be the facilitator and organizer of the focus groups. So we wanted a neutral party to, to run these. We also, though, gathered information directly from the Autism Alliance in our state about the ongoing challenges and concerns related to ED boarding. We connected with the Michigan Health and Hospital Association to reach their network. And really the aim of these focus groups was to hear specifically from partners within Michigan to inform our initial steps in planning, to consider pilot sites, to consider how to build our team, what might be needed, what the model might look like and the workflow might look like, but always knowing that we would really be collaborating with pilot sites to work out those details. Next slide, please. So, uh, you know, given given the membership and the expertise of our statewide advisory committee, as well as the publicity about the mental health crisis, 
nationally and in Michigan, we, we had what we anticipated would likely be some of the themes and concerns of treating behavioral health within the ED setting. But we really wanted to hear directly from those in these settings in our state, and especially to learn what, uh, more specifically, what would inform our next steps, who we might need to have on our team, a general sense of the model and the mode of delivery. So we worked with our partners uh, at MDHHS, at Michigan Public Health Institute, and others to develop the focus group questions. We included open-ended and poll questions as well. Sometimes people are a little more comfortable responding to a poll than, than responding live. Uh, we um, the questions focused on common presenting problems, on challenges, treating behavioral health in the ED setting on uh, workflows and how these uh, entities might use our offerings. Next slide, please. So participants were recruited by email. Uh, we sent these emails to our contacts and all of these networks. And um, at the time we were not connected to the EMSC. Uh, I wish we were because we now are connected to, to that entity and they, I can tell they, they would have been really helpful in having uh, even more connections to, pe to participants. But um, we, at the time, connected with uh, our network to, to reach out, uh, including that emergency department of community practice. Next slide, please. So as far as implementation, we, there were two focus groups that were held one in March, one in April. Uh, again, those were conducted by the Michigan Public Health Institute. Um, the, there were six participants. There were more people who had registered actually. And participants included nurses and physicians, directors and managers. So there was leadership there as well. And we had representation from urban and rural settings. Next slide, please. Uh, so participants, just a little bit about the results. Participants identified presenting problems of acute aggression, self-harm, autism spectrum, um, disorders, trauma. And now that we're, we're launching and meeting with pilot sites, we're hearing this same information. It's consistent with um, what we've heard nationally also about the needs in the emergency department setting. So uh, significant concerns about violent behaviors and the need for more acute, higher level of care services that are not necessarily available. Next slide. The specific challenges that were noted, also similar to what we've, we've heard about with the lack of access to psychiatric care within the ED setting in the community, lack of inpatient options for those in need, lengthy boarding and the issues occurring during the boarding of, of children. In fact, we met recently with our site and learned that um, many of the children who are boarding are there without parents or caregivers, and it's the nurses who are, who are uh, watching them and, and intervening and, and taking on the care. Um, next slide, please. So the facilitator of the focus group described our program and what we might be able to offer, asked participants what they would be most interested in. And what was interesting is uh, they, the response we got was that individual psychiatric consultation was at the, at the top of their most needed service. Group case consultation was second. Now that we're doing the work, we're realizing that what people identify as a need and what they can actually do, what they have time for uh, are not necessarily the same thing. So we can tell this will be this will be challenging. We want to meet the needs, but we know how difficult it will be in terms of the time people have. Um, so we um, heard also that people wanted information about resources and referrals and educational sessions that um, would meet the needs as, as far as the mode. Um, and and time that people had available. So we heard about the topics people were interested in on behavioral management, referrals, medications. And you know it was interesting, despite the number of participants, the information was really rich that we received. and and most importantly, we have these partners now in our pilot sites to collaborate on building a model that will be most helpful to them. So we're now returning back to the focus group data 
we have several work groups as part of the work we're doing. Just an hour ago, met with our work group focused on education, and we could review the results of the focus groups and see what types of education providers are most, or the ED providers are most interested in and work with that and, and build on what we already gathered. Um, next slide, please. So just to let you know where we're at in our process, we uh, used the time last spring to identify, uh, to explore the needs of the emergency departments. And now we're working on developing the model in partnership with our first site and bringing on a second site soon. Uh, so looking at confirming the readiness of the sites and we'll be implementing our model next year. So we have some time to implement all of the components that are required to get this going and launched and we'll be evaluating and improving as we go along. So um, next slide, that's that's our summary and our work. Happy to answer any questions now or another time. And like I said, I included all of the questions that we had in our focus groups in the slides that you'll be receiving. So thank you. Thank you so much, Anne. We will open the floor for questions. So you are welcome to drop them in the chat or you are welcome to unmute yourselves and ask. I actually have a question, if you don't mind, Anne. So I, I think that's interesting that with that data that you you got from your focus groups, they said that that one-on-one -on -one consultation was really what they wanted most. But what you're seeing is that because of time restrictions or maybe they don't necessarily kind of know their bandwidth just yet. Do you guys have any initial plans on like how you might use that data to maybe communicate that back? Um, or like what your thoughts are and kind of like reconvening with those folks to say, hey, I know you said this, but we're seeing, you know, this instead. Well, we, we very much have those questions, especially around the education, because we, uh, you know, there's a lot of interest expressed in, in receiving education, but the reality is um, the timing will be challenging. So we feel like we have to really dig in, go back, understand the workflow and where we'll be able to be available. Um, so it's it's all working out the details right now, meeting with them, but they're, they'll be part of our work group. So it's not as if we're going back separately and, and coming up there. It, we're having deep working sessions. No, that's fantastic. And what do you think has been kind of like a, I know when you have to bring people into a room, bring together to have focus groups, like sometimes it can be hard to get that information out of folks. And I know that you have a lot of collaborating partners who I, I think give additional credence to like folks participating, but what do you feel has been kind of like your greatest success in getting the information that you need? I think people want to be heard. They they want a solution to, to this problem. And so any opportunity to be able to share what's going on, if they think that there might be a solution, I think there's motivation there. So um, we haven't had a problem with people not being uh, willing, that's for sure. We, Like I, I mentioned um, earlier, we weren't yet connected with the Emergency Medical Service for Children Network. We now are and think that will really be valuable. That's great. Thank you. I'm curious if there are any other, any questions or thoughts from those on the call, or if there's anybody who might be in a similar place that wants to share their experiences. Hi, Ann. I just have a, a quick question uh, regarding resource collection. I know that resources are, are challenging at times because they're often changing and there's such a shortage, um, you know, likely nationwide. Are you able to, to hear me, everyone? I don't know if my, okay. I'm gonna make sure my, my um, internet is okay. So I'm, I'm, I'm wondering about like if you've experienced any snags when it comes to like ensuring that resources that you are providing to the, the EDs are in fact updated and if there's any any like challenges around like 
providing the, the, the resources that folks really need. Well, we're certainly learning. We, we haven't launched yet. So we have what we do for the primary care consultation is we have regional and local behavioral health consultants who, are, who build those directories of resources. We'll want to know from the ED sites what they already have access to, who's, who's providing the referrals, what are they tapping into to know what's all out there, and then build from from there. So either we'll be accessing what they're accessing or we'll build on that you know, okay. and tap into our network. Thank you. Um, I have a question regarding um, what comes next after this um, uh, research. I wonder um, how would you how do you identify the next steps and what measures you will be focusing on, um, like length of stay or um, how do, how does it look um, after this um, after this research? So what we where we're at now is we've identified the areas we need to focus on and we've built the internal teams to work on that. We're calling them work groups. So one work group just focusing on education, another working on site implementation, another on model development, and making sure we have key individuals uh, participating in those. So we're, we just built those work groups, just had our first meeting an hour ago. So uh, that's each work group is identifying their next steps and we'll all come together uh, to report into the bigger planning group. And that planning group has representation also from the participating sites. So we want to make sure they're they're always part of the process. So we I don't know if I can be more specific than that because we're just getting launched in the in the planning phase. Yeah, it's just impressive that you included all all of those in the next step. Um, yeah. Thank you. Rosie, I see your hands up. Hi, first of all, thank you very much. This is encouraging. And um, I appreciate that you said your relationship with the EMSC came after you'd already established the ad additional relationships. So ours is um, in Delaware, maybe working the opposite way. Um, our relationship with EMSC is growing. But you said something that I'd like to um, ask a little bit of, more about. You said that there were several systems where behavioral health and the um for children was a priority within the within the um health system itself how did you identify those hospitals where that was a priority because in delaware right now while behavioral health is a component it's not doesn't rise to the top uh it rises to the top of need but not in terms of what um systems and programs have to be implemented in the hospitals uh Right. So that was that was a SAMHSA funded project. It wasn't our project, but a colleague of ours who um, who led that. And I, I believe they were implementing it was for health systems that had a priority to implement zero suicide. Oh, and, right. Okay. That's what you yeah, said. So, okay. So yeah. is I guess then my question would be for the how, how did, so you were able to connect with them. How did you know that they had that grant? Our wonderful partners at MDHHS, Mary Luke is uh -huh. on the call right now and said, okay. yep, I know what's happening around the state. Okay. <laughs> Let me connect you. <laughs> and if DCPAP in our case is leading the effort, um, we're a few years behind, but maybe that's something that we can, think about and help steward for other departments or other systems in the future. Like if that's something that's needed in the state to write, to bring behavioral health to the forefront of the emergency space, they might be able to secure additional grants and then we can partner. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? These are great questions. Uh, 
All right. Hearing none, you can see Anne's information on there, but we can share it uh, post meeting as well if you think of anything else after the meeting. All right, let us move ahead. And I know that you have your questions there so we can send that out post meeting as well. All right, so I wanna kick this over to my colleagues, Hannah and Amy um, around our technical assistance toolkit. You're probably wondering how we have these linked between this wonderful presentation and then our toolkit. Um, again, just to give you a little bit of background, again, this toolkit was really the manifestation of a lot of different focus group discussions that we hosted ourselves, um, really getting to know PMHCA infrastructure um, so we could better address those needs and opportunities and create a technical assistance toolkit that was broad enough to meet, you know, meet all most needs of PMHCs who are looking to expand into the ED space. This is by no means a final product. It's just final for now. Um, and so again, we, we definitely welcome feedback um, on this tool. And again, the way that we view a lot of our, a lot of how we view this toolkit and your, your work in ED expansion is really kind of, is we've bucketed in three different ways. There's an exploration phase, which is really what Anne and team have been doing with their project. Um, the next phase we call it, you know, in, installation is really where you've kind of already laid the groundwork and you've gotten all the information you need and you've begun to, you know, build your program. Um, and then finally, just kind of the launch, the implementation of it. It's just when you have it, the ship is built and you're ready to set sail. So just kind of keep that in mind and I'll pass it off to Hana who can talk a little bit more about just how our toolkit is structured. Hello everyone. Um, next slide, Jen. Okay, so, and I'm not sure if anyone, anyone's gone out there to look at it, but I will share the link um, after I do the presentation and I go over the, the website. Uh, so overview, as Jen said, we create this to assist PMACs who are seeking to expand their programs into the emergency department, kind of like what Anne was talking about today. Um, and we also did this based on the feedback we got from our year one teams that participate in our program. A lot, they did a lot of focus groups, so we got a lot of information to help us build this toolkit. Um, so the three steps to consider that are in this toolkit is identifying ED opportunities, understanding your team's level of readiness, and planning your team's work. And I'll, I'll show that in the, in the toolkit in a little bit. Um, next slide. So here's an image of it. Um, some of the features on this is how to use it. There's the three steps. Um, the ED care pathway, which Anne just mentioned something similar in her, her uh, presentation about knowing the pathway, and I'll show that on the website as well. Um, web pages, that, there are additional web pages in step two that have these four key areas, and these were the focus areas that we talked to with our PMHCs in year one, which were capacity and capability, medical, legal, and reimbursement, partnerships and collaboration, and technology. And then we have a glossary and resources as well. Next slide. And some additional features, and these are important to, uh, to look at, and they will be on every page, is we have this team activity. So these are like questions that you want to address with your team to create a comprehensive plan that sets realistic expectations. Uh, we have some pro tips tips to help you assess your team's infrastructure and begin to determine your ED expansion work. And then the four S's, which is stuff, the tools and resources you have available to you, staff, your current staffing and personnel, space, the spaces you're working within, and systems, the policies and procedure, uh, procedures in place guiding your work. And so as I go in the toolkit, you'll see where these are and how it makes more sense. Like right now, just having it up here does, until you see it in the toolkit, it'll make more sense. And Next slide. So where do we begin, right? Step one. So this will be the first step on our toolkit is understanding the needs of your ED, learning the ED workflow. As like Anne mentioned, she's like learning her ED workflow. Um, conduct a needs assessment and consider running focus groups discussions. Next slide. Okay, and so let me share my screen. I don't, Amy, Amy put the, uh, my colleague Amy put the link in there. So. Okay. 
Okay, can y'all see the toolkit? Yes. Okay, perfect. And so Amy put the link in there. So if you go into this page, I would I would really um, suggest bookmarking this page. So you can just add a bookmark depending on your browser. So if you go down, we call it Engaging Emergency Departments. So here is an intro at the beginning of what the toolkit is about, this paragraph. When you jump into the next section is how to use the toolkit. So this is where it explains the roadmap on how to use this toolkit, where to start, some of the questions to ask yourself. So step one, so if you notice, it's an ex you have to click on this according to expand it. And this is where we talk about the goals, understanding what you're doing, understanding what matters the most. And we go into what consider, like EDs continue, you know, all the different questions to consider. And here's what you do. So the review to ED care pathway, which is also over here on the left. So we have two links on here. Review ways the PMHs can support ED. So here's another document. And here's a needs assessment and explaining what it is. And we also have some sample questions you can use for the needs assessment. Step two is really important because you have to understand your team's level of readiness. And this is where you, when we talk about the goal, here's what to consider. So this is where we have the team activity listed, the pro tips to consider, and the four S's. And this is where, and in step two, it's really important because this is where our different pages are for the different uh, focus areas. So if I click on capacity and capability, that takes you to this page that talks about this focus area. And we define the terms. We talk about the capacity building for, for ED expansion work, the key things to look at. And then this is where the internal assessment pops up again, which we have the team activity, which these are the questions to consider. There's several questions, so you would have to like scroll at this. The pro tips as well. What is expanding your capacity, connections to the community, and then the four S's as well. Uh, and these all relate to each focus area. So if I, when I go back, I will click on medical, legal, and reimbursement, and you will see the same thing. We have the definition, the disclaimer, team's legal framework. And again, we go into the internal assessment with team activity, pro tips about risk and liability, and the four S's to consider for this um, topic. And then, uh, and there's two more, but I won't go into them for the sake of time. And I feel like you can probably navigate them on your own. <laughs> and so step three is planning your team's work. So again, we talk about the goals, what to consider, and then what to do. And what to do, we have links to our quality improvement. So this is our resources and our framework within EIC website. And it's it just has a lot of information that you can go and navigate. And then we also have a glossary, which is really neat because Amy created this. And what I love about it is that it has all the terms that we mention, and we can keep adding to these, but this is these are terms that are mentioned in our toolkit. So if you are stumbled upon, if you don't know what something means or what, you know, when you define the definition, it's listed on here. And then our resources, this is important because this is something we're going to continue to build on. So right now we have suicide prevention and intervention resources that you can look at and some suicide screening tools. And then the this is just learning more about our work. So this takes you to this other page to learn more about PMHCAs and our work. And this is our page. Um, so that's the toolkit in a nutshell so far. Do you want to chime in, Jen, for anything or Amy? I can no, try. you did a great job. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, this took a lot of work, by the way. It was not it was a lot of work. <laughs> no, thank you, Hannah. And I, I think, so there's a couple ways that you can view this toolkit. So the way that we're presenting it both today and in the upcoming two tutorials is really in sequence. So you can view it from that lens of, hey, I'm a team that's just starting out and I really don't know where to begin or you know, you could be in that kind of exploration phase or infrastructure building phase. So similar to, you know, Anne's journey in conducting those focus groups and really getting to understand the needs of the ED 
again, that's really step one in your ED expansion efforts. And so on that main landing page, we would recommend that would be the first place that you start. Obviously you can't go somewhere without knowing the destination. So really focusing in on, do you know what the EDs in your community need? Um, are you getting the right people at the table? Are you considering the right questions to ask? Um, and again, we've we've created a, a sampling of questions, you know, and we kind of categorize them by, you know, maybe some gen more generalizable questions versus, you know, education-based questions, et cetera. Um, but again, it's really just a starting template for you. You might consider other questions um, yourselves, um, or you might, you know, as you guys interact with one another and learn from each other, there might be questions that maybe we didn't consider. So these are all listed here. Um, but you have to be cognizant too of the questions that you ask. You can ask it from the perspective of, hey, what do you need? But you also might wanna consider tailoring those questions to, hey, what can our team actually offer? Um, we saw, you know, many different kinds of assessments, ones that again, we're just trying to gather as much information as possible. Others were very specific and tailored to the services that they knew that they could provide and it was really just trying to gauge the interest from EDs. Um, so there's really no right or wrong way to do it. It's just what works best in your situation. Um, and so we recommend for teams to start there. And then from there, you can probably do it in parallel too, assessing your own, you know, your team's own internal capacity. Um, figuring out, do you have the infrastructure? Can you anticipate some of the needs in your community? You know, that's a consideration and that's where those subsequent pages really come in. Um, understanding your capacity. Do you understand, you know, kind of the legalities in your state? Um, or, you know, it kind of varies by hospital by hospital, but that's how we typically approach it from the outset. However, there are teams on here who have been in the game for a while already, and you might be well past this exploration phase. You can also treat this tool very a la carte. Um, so it is designed for you to kind of pick and choose your adventure as you see fit. Um, so that's been the fun challenge of putting something like this together where it's broad enough to be flexible to meet you where you're at. Um, but again, we also know that again, while we had amazing input from you know six or seven different teams from last year, that's six or seven teams. We know that every team is different. And so there are probably considerations that we didn't factor in here. Um, so throughout this, this tutorial series, um, we're gonna be educating you and kind of paralleling it to how you can view it in your journey. Again, Anne is a great example um, of MC3's exploration and really building that groundwork um, and how that can parallel to what you see in the toolkit. And we'll continue to do that with, you know, maybe more infrastructure building versus implementation. Um, but we are always open to feedback. And so uh, with a lot of time remaining, again, I would love for anybody else in our immediate group or Anne to chime in on anything additional, but we wanna solicit your feedback as well. And so after this meeting, we'll be sending out um, both the recording as well as a link for you to provide your feedback. Um, and we'll be doing that over the next several months as you get oriented with the tool. We wanna hear from you to say, hey, this is a great, or hey, like you should add this and this is a great consideration. Um, so I'll stop talking there. <laughs> no. So no, it's just something that, you know, it's not permanent. So we wanna let people know that this is going to be evergreen. We're going to be going to be evolving. We'll add more things on there as we learn more. And we know that there's still some work to do with our resources and, and a couple of things, but we wanted to produce something for our teams. Um, any questions that you'll have right now? Anybody? Or y'all just having fun playing in there? <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Amy, is there anything that we um can, can the share? The only that... thing I was going to say, which Jen just covered, is it, you, this is a work in progress, and and Hannah just covered it as well. This is a work in progress. If you're looking at it and you have a question. Chances are somebody else is having that same question, maybe more than one. So please do not hesitate to reach out um, to our team and say, hey, you know what? I'd really like a definition to this, or I really wish there was a template for that or whatever, because you may be looking for something that everybody else is as well. And we would love to make sure we get you what you need. Yes. And this toolkit is for you. So if, definitely what Amy said, anything that you feel that needs to be on there that is missing or like questions, like 
please let us know and we will definitely work to add those things. I'm gonna start, oh, go ahead, Gary. Um, thank you. Um, I wonder, hmm, I wonder if um, you might have this um, already, but a, maybe um, a pilot readiness checklist um, somewhere to say, for instance, identify when in the same state, the county's needs look very different. Um, and that way, maybe thinking which counties to start with. Um, it, it, it's not a it's not a specific question, but I, I'm wondering when when we find ourselves with counties that are very very different in terms of access to care. I don't think we're very specific on that, but that's something to consider for sure. Um, are you trying to find like how to start when it comes to county level? Is that what you're asking? Like, yeah, maybe maybe assessing um, which count what's what's the basics to start with. Um, okay, maybe, maybe comparing whether to start with a county that is. Um, it does not have that many access to care or it's not as easy as opposed to one that it might be a little bit um, ready for it, trying to balance for that. I, I see what you're talking about more like, I know what you're talking about, more like rural versus urban and like those different accesses, access points, which counties. Yeah, I don't think we have something like that, but we could definitely add something in the future. and. So that's something we can consider and, and look into that. And Rosalia, so you have your hands hand up. No, I I think that um, it's a really interesting point. So Delaware has three counties, so we're not that big, um, but the the Sussex County is our most rural and um, with the fewest number of resources. And so we thought when we got started that that would be where we would um, see the most traction. The fact of the matter is we got started and we were seeing the most traction in Newcastle County, which is our largest county, our more populous county. And so we're working out the kinks, but we're definitely um, going in the next several months to try to focus on the more rural county based on the experience we have in the bigger and more populous county where we've gotten traction. So the needs are the services I think that we, we provide are gonna remain consistent, um, but how we get to them and how we access them and how they act are very different. I wanted to just add that we, um, in, in meeting with the director of the EMSC recently, her recommendation was identifying a site that had a commitment to behavioral health where there was either in infrastructure or the commitment to at least have success in your initial pilot or site uh, or, or else you're not gonna get as far. <laughs> so we've appreciated that guidance. That helps. And you got that guidance. And again, that's the same nugget of information that I got from your first presentation. So you got that guidance from the EMSC coordinator because she or they, um, Knew, knows the hmm. inner workings and priorities of each system that they're supporting. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. That's a that's a good question. That's a great next step for us, I think, as well. Thank you. That's good information because we can tie in with our state partnerships and kind of dig into that info. Think so, Jen? Yes. Yeah, so, <laughs> so you were muted. No, no. I think that's great. So there, yeah. There's really two levels to that. So one, it's um, like I could see in addition to this resource, it's almost like a matrix of options. Because you're right, you could identify, you know, the most rural county who has like the least amount of resources. They might be a good partner. However, you also have to balance that with: is that a priority for them? Do they have the bandwidth to work with you, et cetera? So there's, I think that's good for us internally consideration that we can maybe help craft a matrix around that because I think those. They kind of go hand in hand. It goes, you know, both. Um, so I think that's a good consideration. But the other two, and again, I, if you've been on our previous webinars, um, we've we've really been working to create a better linkage between the EMSC state partner program as well as the PMHCA programs. 
Um, and again, as a refresher, for those who might not be familiar with the state partnership program is, um, they are state-based organizations who are very entrenched in the emergency care system in their state. Um, so these folks have really close relationships with their EMSC state agencies, um, EDs, uh, pre-hospital workers, et cetera. So they're very embedded in that work and are really focused on spreading best, best care 